Welcome to the inaugural episode of Municipal Affairs, a groundbreaking new show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. Now, we are excited to be bringing you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. Every Monday, we will be your guide to understanding the pulse of Canadian communities. We'll be sitting down with mayors, councillors, wardens, Reeves, and local officials who are at the forefront of driving change and progress within their municipalities. In Municipal Affairs, we're committed to bringing your go-to source for all things related to municipal news, from the latest updates on municipal elections and conferences to major breaking stories that have an impact on local communities. We're here to keep you informed and engaged. But we won't stop there. We recognize the importance of providing a well-rounded perspective. That's why we'll also be speaking with local politicians who are shaping policies and visions, CAOs who are pivotal in executing those visions, municipal administration officials who are driving day-to-day -day operations, and other stakeholders who play a crucial role in shaping the intricate landscape of municipal affairs. Now, our goal is to shed light on the issues that matter most to you, whether it's improving urban planning, enhancing community services, addressing housing challenges, or fostering economic growth. By amplifying the voices of those who are actively working towards positive change, our show, Municipal Affairs, aims to empower citizens, leaders, and stakeholders alike. Now, on today's inaugural episode of Municipal Affairs, we turn our attention to the ongoing wildfire situation in British Columbia. We will be sitting down in a one-on-one -on -one interview with Regional District of Central Okanagan Chair, Loyal Woolridge. As the wildfires continue to pose a significant threat, we'll gain insights into the current status of the firefighting efforts, potential evacuation procedures, and the community resilience in the face of this challenging natural disaster. Then we're going to be joined by Randy Golden, the president of the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association. With the recent Saskatchewan Provincial Cabinet Shuffle making headlines in the province, we'll be chatting with President Golden to shed light on the implications of these changes for municipalities from across the province of Saskatchewan. From policy shifts to new leadership dynamics, will uncover what the shuffle means for Saskatchewan's urban municipalities. And finally, to round off this first episode, we'll be taking you behind the scenes of the most recent Association of Municipalities Ontario conference held in London, Ontario. This gathering of municipal leaders provided a platform for discussion on crucial matters affecting communities within the province. Our peek behind the curtain will give you a comprehensive view of the efforts being undertaken to drive positive change in Ontario's municipalities. But first, as we said, we head first to the Regional District of Central Okanagan and chat with Regional Chair Loyal Woolridge. Uh, Chair Woolridge, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I want to get basically a good understanding of sort of what's been happening over the last week. Uh, Canadians from coast to coast to coast are watching with the sort of uh, intensity of what's going on in the central Okanagan district right now. And for you, what's been going on and how's the sort of mentality in the central Okanagan right now? So um, first, I'm speaking to you today from the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Silk Okanagan people, also known as the Central Okanagan. Um, and yes, we've been ravaged by uh, the forest fires this season. British Columbia has been faced with our worst drought climate um, in our history. And we've seen those fires moving all the way from the north um, down into the south. Um, the current fire that's burning out of control is the McDougal Creek wildfire. And it's currently sitting at 13,712 hectares um, and still burning out of control. And um, of course, it's called the Grouse Complex um, Fires because that fire jumped the lake um, a couple of weeks ago and started burning into Kelowna as well as um, Lake Country. So um, the Kelowna portion and Lake Country portion is now under control. Obviously, there's still a lot of anxiety um, on the West Kelowna side, the West Bank First Nation side, and the electoral area west. Um, because crews are still working actively to get that fire under control. 
Now, there are some parts of the area that is still burning out of control, as you've just alluded to. But earlier this week, uh, the mayor of Kelowna just said that some people are able to come start coming back into their communities. This must be some uh, some sense of relief for you with still the understanding that you still are under some sort of evacuation notice because things could change at a moment's notice, right? Exactly. So the Kelowna side is definitely under control and we're welcoming visitors back. We did have a provincial order for a few days to free up rooms in um, in the hotels. Um, but Kelowna is open for business and we're welcoming visitors to come back now that we head into September. Um, but the other side of the lake is still a concern. And uh, we're just now starting to lift orders and get people back to their homes, whether they've been damaged or not. Um, so currently we have about 487 orders still in place on the west side and over 20,000 people still on alert. So the, the event is still very active on the west side of, of Kelowna, um, but definitely on the Kelowna side, our response was um, was a little bit quicker because it's a bit more urban. So there was less fuel to, to manage the fire and uh, we're able to get that under control a lot quicker. So West Kelowna is still a worry. We're breathing a little bit of a sigh of relief, seeing some more humidity and some rain. Um, but we're not out of the woods yet, and then LBC Wildfire advises us that it's under control. It's still quite a worry. Now, you, you've you met with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in the last few weeks. You've also met with the Premier, I'm assuming. You've probably been in contact with provincial authorities. Are they giving you a sense that they're still willing to help you out, even with the transition of people coming back into their communities? Because while the wildfires are still ongoing, there is a sense that sometimes going back into your community after an event like this can cause some mental strain on people. So are the province and the federal governments coming to the table and saying we're helping uh, throughout this, even the aftermath of this uh, natural disaster? So, yeah, I think when the news headlines start to fade and the, the emergent events aren't as prevalent, people think that everything is over. But there's families uh, that are going to be affected for many years to come, whether that's loss that they've experienced from their, their home or it's just the, the mental grief that the, the community is going through collectively. So the province has heard us and, and so has the federal government. It's premature to put dollar values right now to what we're going to be asking for. But we've really set the, the foundation to say, look, this is going to be expensive, it's going to take time, and local governments don't have the resources to upgrade the level of infrastructure that's been damaged. And, and just speaking to that, from an electricity perspective, BC Hydro has reported that like 359 electrical poles have been burned, 66 pieces of equipment need to be replaced, and 27 kilometers of electro electrical lines need to be replaced that were burned. So that's just a glimpse to the BC Hydro side of the damage. That's not talking about the hydrophobic foil, uh, soils rather um, that have been affected that aren't going to uh, absorb water. So we have to be concerned for flooding. Um, we've really expressed to both levels of government that they've got to step up and help us because um, other disasters are could be on the way if those, those issues aren't managed from the get-go. Now, the Central Okanagan region has kind of gone through a lot of uh, big things over the last few years. First COVID-19, then the flooding, and now we're seeing this wildfire. Um, but it seems like the people are still resilient. And it seems like people are still uh, wanting to wanting the best for their community. W what does that tell you about the people of your region? The most beautiful thing when when this crisis began was my DMs personally were lighting up, emails were flooding in and saying, how can I help? I want to volunteer. I want to donate. I want to show up at, at nonprofits and, and support firefighters or evacuees. And, and the Central Okanagan region continually steps up. Of course, when this fire started, it was on the exact day of the 20-year the anniversary of the 2003 firestorm that we experienced here. And nothing brings communities together like crisis. However, what I share with people is it's really about um, the process of grief. The very first stage is disbelief where people just want to help and want to get in there. Um, but it's really that support of community in following months and years that's very important because people's, um, you know, emotions run high and their patients run out. And so it's really important that we continue to support each other while we move through these next stages. Because while some folks are returning home to their beds, others aren't. And we can't forget about those folks that um, are going to have their lives changed for a very long time. 
Now, you are the face of this uh, uh, wildfire in the central Okanagan. You have been sort of on the front lines, but there are people working behind the scenes as well. Com firefighters, people in the EOC, administration from the regional district. Um, we often talk about how the residents are doing. How's your staff doing throughout this last month? Thanks for acknowledging that, Chris. I've been fortunate to be uh, one of the spokespeople throughout the events to bring um, news to, to people every single day. But it is that team behind me that's super supportive. Um, the regional district, for context, for those that don't know that model throughout Canada, is a, um, a collective of municipalities and unincorporated areas that share services to make it um, more affordable for all communities, especially smaller ones. So we're a service delivery model, and we operate the Emergency Operations Center. So that's why I've been the spokesperson. Um, but all of the mayors and the, the West Bank First Nation chief have been sitting around the table, and we've been working diligently together. And, um, it, you know, they're, they're going to be the spokespeople for their individual areas, but I've been fortunate to bring that forward. Now, to your question about staff, it's, it's very wearing because these emergency events have become annual. It's not just every so often, but we're seeing them intensify. We're seeing them more frequently, whether that's going from flood season into fire season into atmospheric rivers or crane collapses that we saw a couple of years as well. So what we're really working on now is looking to the future of how we become more resilient in our emergency response models. Um, staff are definitely tired. We still have um, you know, 360 frontline firefighting staff working on McDougal Creek as we speak, but then all of those people behind the scenes in the EOC that are also doing their daily job in city hall or the regional district office that are pulling extra shifts to support us in the emergency time. So people are definitely getting tired and fatigued. We're making sure that we have those psychological supports in place to support people that are working on this. Um, but uh, hopefully we can see some light at the end of the tunnel here with the weather changing, but it is top of mind to take care of people's um, uh, psychological health. Last question for you here before I let you go. I, 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 we, we are in the first few days of September, which means back to school for a lot of kids right now. And I know as your role as chair, you're looking at the regional district as a whole, but we have to worry about the kids as well uh, for those who are going back to school. Have you been in contact with the Ministry of Education, with the school board trustees in your area to talk about what's going on and getting that message out to let people know that you don't send your kids to school if you're in this area because you're you need to be evacuated. So uh, we're continuing the messaging with our school district around who's in alerts and who's in order zones. And we started the preliminary work if the event hadn't started to be more controlled by now. Luckily, we're, we're looking a little bit more positive. So we are in lockstep with, uh, with the school district, who is the conduit up to the Ministry of Education. Um, but I will also share that yesterday we opened a resiliency center on West Bank First Nation land. And this is going to be a hub of um, psychosocial supports for people that are going to need it throughout the next few months and years. And um, that's going to be open seven days a week from nine until eight. And we've basically convened a, a lot of organizations and insurance companies. So it's going to be a one-stop shop as we move through the recovery phase. And that's where folks can um, find those resources that they may not have access to, whether that's Samaritan's Purse or it's your insurance company. And then further down the line, when we're when we're ready to talk about rebuilding, that's also where we'll house some of our urban planners and, and uh, folks to help to support people. So they're not having to run all over the place. Now, I know that I said that was my last question, but I just want to make sure that this gets on the record. Where can people find updated information with everything going on in the world with meta and news not being readily available? What's the best source of in, uh, information for people out there who are listening to this or seeing this right now? So right now, our hub is cordemergency.ca. That's C-O-R-D emergency.ca. And on that website, you'll find all the links to the Resiliency Center as well as updates on the current events. Um, that link will probably change as we move fully into the recovery stage, but we still are encouraging people to go to courtemergency.ca to get the most up-to-date information from our EOC on the wildfire events, and then the links onto the other supports. Perfect. Thank you so much, Loyal, for this, and uh, best of luck over the long weekend, and uh, hopefully the firefighters get some rest, but also continually battle the fire out there. Thanks so much, Chris, and I really appreciate you helping get the word out. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most, in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together 
we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. Now joining us from Yorkton, Saskatchewan, is none other than Randy Golden, the distinguished president of the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association. Last week, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe announced a major cabinet shuffle. Now, we invited President Golden to be our guide through the twists and turns of this political development. We're going to be diving deep into the implications of these changes for municipalities across the province and the hopes for SUMA as the summer draws to a close and the fall session of the Saskatchewan Legislature is set to begin. Uh, President Golden, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with the uh, big news that came out of Saskatchewan provincial government uh, on the 29th of August, which was there was a major shuffle in some of the most senior portfolios. What does this mean for SUMA going forward? You know, Chris, uh, and thanks a lot for having me on again. It's always so good to uh, to have these conversations with you and uh I can say that uh, after we heard of uh, some of the retirements and, and mainly uh, longtime MLA and cabinet minister Don Morgan um, choosing to not run again, um, you know, I think everyone in Saskatchewan knew that this was coming, that we would be seeing some changes. Um, and indeed, that's that's what we did. Um, you know, maybe we thought it might have been a little later into the into the fall. And I commend the the premier uh, for taking a look and understanding that going into an election as they're going into, but more, I guess, uh, more to some of the the advocacy concerns and issues that Suma has. There are so many things on the table that we need to deal with now. Um, that uh, he chose to make this uh, these changes. And, you know, it's it's always a challenge for groups like SUMA, uh, another order of government like our municipal governments, when there's ministry changes, because we work very hard uh, with the ministers and with their officials uh, to build up awareness and education on what all orders of government and our roles and our responsibilities and what we're dealing with every day. So when there's a change, um, then it means that we need to take a look at what we're doing, how we're doing it, and uh, continue the work. But there's a pause now that's going to happen probably with the uh, municipalities, because while the ongoing uh, conversations that you've been having with some of the ministers will still on go, but there may be a little bit of a pause because now new ministers are being appointed, new staff members are being appointed, which means that the advocacy work is probably going to pause for a bit. You know, and I know that municipalities can't pause. They still have to continuously grow. How do you see yourself navigating the next few weeks, month, until the ministers are up uh, on their new portfolios? Because with education, health, highways, those are three substantial portfolios that you deal with on a regular basis. And I know they're provincial jurisdictions, but when I was touring and talking to members of your province of Saskatchewan, I hear those three topics brought up a lot. And, you know, I think you probably heard a fourth, uh, policing and corrections. Yeah. <laughs> There's been a change in that also, Chris. And, you know, it was so interesting because as this became the news of the day, the news of the week, um, I was thinking, oh, we have to connect right away. And when you mention, you know, the, the work that officials also do, as I was saying that letters were being drafted uh, for me to sign under my name, for me to approve, first of all, and sign that would go out within hours after the change. And it was, um, you know, congratulating the ministers on their appointments. And uh, the next paragraph talked about how we were offering anything that we could to work together because we know some of the challenges uh, that are facing um, all orders of government. And, and uh, you know, it's, it might be cliche, but I think we all know we're the closest to the people. We're the people that, heavens, on, on the, my walk this morning where I got absolutely drenched, I had someone stop as it's raining to talk with me about a policing issue. So, you know, when you say we're closest to the people, indeed, no matter where we go in our communities, and that's the way we want it. 
does Suma have hope that because Minister Don McMorris, I, I just wanted to make sure I pronounced his last name here right, um, was kept in the portfolio of governmental relations, this gives a little bit of somewhat of a continuity that allows the Suma organization and municipalities to continue working with the government during this little bit of a transition period for the cabinet? Well, and, and I think you're absolutely correct in that, Chris, when you're saying that. So uh, Minister McMorris with government relations is remaining in his position. Um, so that will, uh, we would assume that will be going into the next election. Um, and we've worked very closely with uh, with Minister McMorris. Um, I like to think that much to do with advocacy is relationship building also. Um, and we've worked very hard on those. Uh, and I don't just mean myself as president, the past presidents, all of the boards. Um, SUMA has under, uh, taken, and this is the second summer we've done this, and we call it our MLA engagement strategy, where our board members um, go out uh, because they're seeing our MLAs. This is the time for the MLAs to get out of their offices and go into the communities. So we're seeing them, whether they're at events or parades or fairs or barbecues or awareness uh, days, um, such as we had last night here in Yorkton with drug, uh, drug overdose uh, awareness. Uh, we're seeing our MLAs. So we have a strategy to talk to them on our advocacy points. Um, so that doesn't mean just ministers. It means everyone. And, you know, when, when I chat with uh, Minister McMorris, he has been in government for quite some time, and he knows um, all of the uh, files very, very well, including government relations, um, which, which really helps us. You know, when I have uh, some conversations to him about uh, uh, SAMA, Saskatchewan Assessment Management Agency, who has not had a funding increase from provincial government for many, many years, well, you know who's picking up any of the increases. It's the municipalities where, um, you know, SAMA does the uh, assessment for our municipalities, but that's how so all the education tax is collected too. So, you know, things that we work together on. So um, we will continue working with Minister McMorris. He also sits on treasury board. Um, so understands finances. And yes, we work very closely. The other minister that was not changed is the Minister of Finance. So Minister Harpower is still there too. Um, and although, um, you know, Minister Harpower knows her file, uh, we still will be advocating for increased um, finances and, and uh, you know, uh, different ways that our municipalities can work together with her. Mm -hmm. Out of the four big portfolios that were changed, whether that be education, health, highways, or even corrections and policing and police service, public safety, what's priority number one for SUMA? Who do you want to speak to first? I know there's probably already ongoing invites to sit down with these new ministers, and I, I'm just I'm guessing there. But what is priority number one? Because Policing is something that's on top of a lot of people's minds right now, uh, but also education and even healthcare is on top of minds for a lot of people. So what's SUMA's role right now in trying to educate these new ministers who have been shuffled into new portfolios to get them up to speed on the municipal side of the, these portfolios? Well, you know, Chris, you always ask such interesting <laughs> questions, but when you're asking those questions, there's multiple answers. So my priority right now is to meet with the premier. And we put that request in uh, and we put that request in after the three by-elections here in our province, where that night after the results came in, the premier did state that, uh, you know, with some of the changes that they've seen and some of the um, issues they heard coming out of those by-elections, they wanted to meet with municipalities. So immediately the next morning, <laughs> we offered uh, at any time, any place to meet with the premier. So that, that is number one on my on my agenda. And then there's several, as, as you know, um, in February 2022, SUMA adopted mental health and addictions as a cornerstone advocacy issue. So what that means, it means no matter whom we're talking with, what minister, it doesn't matter if it's, uh, you know, Jeremy Harrison from Minister with the, uh, with the Economy and Business, we, we still chat with him and talk with him about the importance of what our communities are facing with mental health and addictions. So I would say to you, um, health, um, and Minister Hindley moves from rural health 
to the health minister now. So he knows that file. Um, along with the other minister that was not moved, and that's uh, Minister Mikowski with Social Services. So we're that's kind of a joint that we would like to hold, and uh, definitely would like to meet with, um, you know, Mr. Merriman now with uh, policing and corrections because very much um, we're looking at a review of the Police Act here in Saskatchewan. Yeah, uh, we did a white paper about two years ago, and it identified many, many different things that need to be changed uh, with the Police Act. So it's not just adding amendments, because that, that's all that's been done since uh, the 1990s. We now need a complete review. And there's precedent in British Columbia, in Manitoba, uh, in Alberta, they're looking at that. So we need to work on that also. Uh, Premier Mo has been making the rounds in the last few weeks since those three by-elections early in August. Um, he's been meeting with uh, mayors and council members and even your uh, rural counterpart, SARM members as well. Um, does this give you hope that you might get that coveted uh, meeting here soon, that you'll be able to sit down with the Premier and talk about these issues that are facing SUMA members, but municipalities in general? We certainly hope so. And, you know, soon, you know, session starts in a little bit. So um, that will bring him closer to Regina and uh, uh, not able to do as much uh, in, in the uh, rural and, and other areas of Saskatchewan. And in saying that, we've also, uh, over the summer, a few weeks ago, um, I had a, a wonderful meeting uh, with our sister organization, SARM, with their president and and uh, um, their executive director, uh, along with Jean-Marc, our CEO in, in SUMA. And we talked about what we can work together. And one of the key things, and this affects all of the, the changes that might have happened in the ministers that stained in their portfolios, is looking at a protocol for consultations. Because no matter if you're SARM or SUMA, we get requests from provincial governments saying, you know, could you check with your members and let us know we're looking at regulations or legislation around this? And, you know, can you let us know in two weeks time? Well, that's a difficult that's a difficult time space. We're happy they're coming to us, but to get a true ref uh, reflection from our members takes a little bit longer than two weeks. So we're looking at uh, jointly, uh, you know, working together with provincial government to try to make that happen. Randy, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's always a great pleasure to sit down and chat with you. With the Manitoba provincial election expected to be called within hours of this show, the Association of Manitoba Municipalities has taken a proactive step to ensure that local issues are at the forefront of the political discussion this election season. In a move aimed to amplify the voices of municipal leaders, the AMM has released a series of videos featuring municipal leaders from across the province discussing critical issues affecting their communities. The AMM's Let's Grow Manitoba Together campaign is designed to make the municipal priorities a central focus during the 2023 Manitoba provincial election. The campaign's objective is to engage both voters and political candidates in meaningful conversations about the challenges and opportunities faced by municipalities across Manitoba. In the short videos released by the AMM, municipal leaders from various regions of the province passionately advocate for issues ranging from infrastructure to economic development to public safety. Hello, my name's Mayor Larry Johansson, Mayor of the City of Selkirk. I'm here to talk about protective services. Protective services is a real a bee in my bonnet, so to speak. I'm creeping up, we're creeping up to 30% of our annual budget on protective services. So we need help. Um, now we're, we're getting some downloading for, from the RCMP, from the federal government on the, the body cameras, the back pay, and these things are ludicrous. We just do not have the funding for this. And what we also need funding for is I'm a big proponent for community safety officers, CSOs. Uh, we we're already budgeted for one this year, and we're gonna budget for another one next year, but we wanna have help from the provincial and federal governments on this. With the escalating costs of protective services, I really feel with expanded powers, CSOs are gonna be the way to go for a lot of communities, and we wanna be one of the first ones to divulge in the training of them and the hiring of them. Together, we're going to grow Manitoba, make Manitoba strong. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Sandra Smith and I'm Mayor for the Town of Stonewall. I want to talk to you about public safety. It's important to all of us. We're tired of getting the costs downloaded to us from another level of government. They're reaching into our pockets and we're not involved in the conversation. Let's grow Manitoba together. I'm Mayor Sherilyn Knox, City of Portage La Prairie. Public safety is of utmost importance to municipalities across our province. However, what we're finding is that additional costs are put on municipalities and we're struggling. We want the provincial government to be our partners in alleviating some of those costs. Let's grow Manitoba together. I am Grant Borscavich, we the RM Riding Mountain West. One of the pillars is uh, funding, predictability and fairness. It's very important to the Arbor Riding Mountain West to have a predictable uh, funding model in Manitoba to make sure that our municipalities all across Manitoba can, can grow together, prioritize our investments. Let's grow Manitoba together. As you've just seen, leaders are underscoring the importance of provincial collaboration in addressing local concerns and emphasizing the need for continued partnership between the municipalities and the Manitoba provincial government. The campaign has garnered support from a broad cross-section of municipal leaders, reflecting the diverse needs of Manitoba's communities. These videos, which are on the AMM's website and YouTube page, showcase the experience and perspectives of leaders from cities, towns, and rural areas, highlighting the shared goals of making Manitoba a better place to live, to work, and to invest. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Well, then cross-border interviews is your show. We are here to provide you with exclusive insights and thought-provoking conversations focusing on municipal issues from across Canada. By backing the show for as little as $3 per month, you can help us to continue to grow and bring even more exciting content. We bring you unbiased, unfiltered conversations about municipal issues from coast to coast to coast. Simply visit our website at crossborderinterviews.ca and show your support today. Now, back to the show. From August 21st to the 23rd, the City of London, Ontario played host to a historic gathering of more than 2,500 municipal leaders, government officials, public servants, sponsors, exhibitors, and media representatives at the 2023 Association of Municipalities of Ontario Conference. The event, boasting the largest number of conference participants ever recorded, provided an unparalleled platform for dialogue, collaboration, and progress on critical issues facing Ontario's municipalities. Now, the conference held in the heart of London showcased the collective strength and determination of municipal leaders from across the province. Although municipal leaders were there to work to address multiple issues, a few pressing issues continuously came up. Housing and the state of municipal finances. Colin Best, president of AMO, delivered a address that resonated with conference attendees. With unwavering determination, Best underscored a key area of focus for municipalities, the urgent need for a new fiscal framework. Last November, the government made an important commitment to fully offset the financial impacts of Bill 23, and we'll certainly work with them to fulfill that promise. The promise wants audits of five municipal governments in the Tr Greater Toronto Area. They are underway, and we have not met a municipal treasurer who does not welcome the opportunity to make sure that our fiscal situation is perfectly understood by policymakers at Queen's Park. Inflation is high. Interest rates are growing, and municipalities are the only other order of government where revenue does not grow with the economy. We want the government of Ontario to stand on a solid fiscal foundation, and we want to make sure tax dollars are well spent and that public services are, are delivered good results for all Ontarians. To that end, we should always be asking ourselves which order of government has the capacity to fund key public services and responsibilities. We know the current provincial municipal fiscal framework in Ontario is failing us. It is failing our residents, our small businesses, and our major industries. It needs to be updated for the 21st century. <clears throat> Premier Ford will be here shortly. 
We have seen that his government is willing to make bold changes, and we anticipate he'll be sharing good news this morning. Municipal governments are eager to help. Let's be ambitious. Let's imagine if. Let's work together. Tomorrow's generations are counting on all of us getting Ontario's next chapter right. That's why we're here today. We have come together so we can work together to make our communities and Ontario a better place. AMO is willing to serve as a place where willing leaders come together to achieve better for Ontario. In a landmark announcement at the 2023 AMO conference, Premier Doug Ford unveiled a bold new initiative aimed at accelerating housing construction across the province. The Building Housing Faster Grant is set to usher in a new era of collaboration between the Ontario government and municipalities, providing substantial incentives for communities that take a decisive step to address the housing crisis. Now, the centerpiece of this groundbreaking initiative is a transformative three-year, $1.2 billion program designed to empower municipalities to build homes at an unprecedented pace. This initiative is built on the performance-based model, wherein municipalities that meet or exceed provincial housing targets will receive substantial financial support. One of the most important things we can do as the provincial government is support municipalities in reaching your housing targets. So today, I'm pleased to announce the Building Faster Fund. This new fund is an incentive program that supports municipalities to build more homes. It's a three-year, $1.2 billion program that will reward municipalities for reaching annual housing targets. These targets will be ambitious, but realistic. For the first year of the program in 2023, we want to achieve at least 110,000 new housing starts. It would be the first time in over three decades that Ontario surpassed the 100,000 threshold. From there, we'll ramp up over time until we're on track to build at least 1.5 million homes. Municipalities that reach 80% of their target each year will become eligible for funding based on their share of overall goal of 1.5 million homes. Municipalities that fail to reach at least 80% won't be eligible. But here's the best part. Municipalities that exceed their target, that do better than 100%, get a bonus. Let me take a moment to demonstrate with a few choice examples. Let's take Pickering, one of Ontario's best performers right now, and I want to congratulate Mayor Ash and his council for everything you're doing to get homes built. At Pickering's current pace of building, they're on track to exceed provincial targets by over 150%. If these numbers hold, Pickering could be eligible for over $5 million in new funding. Or let's take Vaughn, another top performer right now, and congratulations to Mayor Del Duca and his council as well. At Vaughn's current pace of building homes, they're on track to exceed provincial targets by a whopping 140%. Again, if these numbers hold, Vaughn will be eligible for $17 million in new funding. And the leader of the pack, Brantford, at Brantford's current pace of building homes, they're on track to hit 176% of their target and would be eligible to receive $4 million additional dollars. So congratulations, Mayor Davis and his council. These are incredible sums of money that will reward municipalities for building homes and help pay for important infrastructure and community building projects. Speaking after the Premier, Housing Minister and Minister of Municipal Affairs, the Honourable Steve Clark, said that collaboration between all levels of government will be needed to address the housing crisis the country is facing today. But we also need the federal government to do its part. That's why we're again calling on Ottawa to work with us to defer the HST on all new large-scale purpose-built rentals. Thank you. And if Ottawa refuses to take the step, Ontario is prepared to lead by example.
and take action ourselves. So that we can build housing that our residents need and they deserve. We're also calling on the federal government to guarantee that at least 10% of the housing accelerator fund is reserved for small northern and rural communities. We, we need to ensure that these, part of the pro these parts of the province are not left behind and we want to ensure that our fair share of federal funding comes forward so municipalities and service managers can properly fund affordable and supportive housing. The 2023 AMO conference not only provided a platform for discussion, but also served as a catalyst for action. It brought together individuals and entities committed to forging a brighter future for all Ontario municipalities. The 2023 AMO conference has set the stage for transformative change in Ontario's municipalities, emphasizing the vital role that they play in shaping the province's future. And also at the conference, it was announced that the AMO 2024 conference will be hosted in the nation's capital of Ottawa from August 18th to 21st in 2024. Uh, just... Just want to thank uh, City Council, the Commission, uh, just for this opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity that I'm very much looking forward uh, to proving the successes of the Grand Prairie Police Service. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to working with everybody. I want to thank the transition team for the work that's already happened, and I look forward to being a part of this community. On August 29th, Dwayne Lacusta was officially sworn in as the inaugural Chief of Police for the Grand Prairie Police Service. This occasion signals a new chapter in the city's commitment to public safety and community relations. Mayor Jackie Clayton of Grand Prairie expressed her delight in a news release welcoming the chief to this significant role. She emphasized the importance of entrusting the leadership of the Grand Prairie Police Service to an individual with unparalleled experience and expertise. The incoming chief was named Grand Prairie's top cop in part to his nearly 30 years in law enforcement, including time with the Edmonton Police Service for 26 years, serving in several roles, including the Drug Undercover Street Team, Project CARE, and the Organized Crime Branch. In her statement, Mayor Clayton echoed the share enthusiasm of Dan Wong, chair of the Grand Prairie Police Commission, for this new era in the city of Grand Prairie. The appointment is one of the first steps for the Alberta community as it begins its transition from the RCMP to a municipal police service. Cross-Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross-Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. As the fall season approaches, several communities across the province of Alberta are gearing up to hold municipal by-elections to fill vacant council seats in their respective councils and even one mayoral position. The upcoming elections are poised to bring about significant changes in local leadership and voters are preparing to cast their ballots in support of their chosen candidates. Now, the town of Penhold, Alberta, is set to head to the polls on September 6th to elect a new representative to fill the vacancy left by Councillor Matt Walsh. A day later, on September 7th, the residents of Tabor, Alberta, will be exercising their right to vote. This election aims to fill the void left by Councillor Elf Rudd. The citizens of Tabor are keen to elect a new representatives who will address local concerns and promote the growth and the development of the town. Now in Claire's home, Alberta, they are bracing for a double by-election on September 18th. This by-election will serve as an opportunity to fill the vacancy left by former Mayor Chelsea Petrovic, who secured a victory in the recent provincial election 
in 2023. Additionally, a council seat left vacant by former Councillor Brad Schlossenberger, who resigned his position to run for the mayoral office, will also be up for grabs on the 18th of September. And on September 19th, residents of Ward 1 in the Municipal District of Bighorn, Alberta, will be heading to the polls. With two candidates vying for the position, this election will determine who will represent the interest and aspirations of Ward 1 in the MD of Bighorn, Alberta. Now, as these dates for these municipal by-elections draw nearer, candidates are actively engaged with voters, sharing their platforms, or even putting up signs in some communities. The outcomes of these elections will undoubtedly shape the local landscapes and voters' are encouraged to make their voices heard by participating in the electoral process. As British Columbia local leaders gear up for the Union of British Columbia Municipalities Conference, anticipation is building, as the gathering is promising to provide insights, strategies, and collaborative solutions to address the pressing challenges faced by communities across the province. Set to take place from September 18th to September 22nd in Vancouver, the conference aims to harness the collective wisdom of municipal officials. And a week later, the 2023 Alberta Municipalities Convention and Trade Show is set to kick off in Edmonton, Alberta. From September 27th to September 29th, this highly anticipated event will bring together municipal leaders, government officials, and industry experts from across the province to discuss critical issues facing Alberta municipalities. And we are excited. We are so excited to announce that this show, Municipal Affairs, and our sister show, Cross Border Interviews, will be live in person at both of these conferences in Vancouver and in Edmonton. And that's a wrap for our first episode of Municipal Affairs. But before we go, I want to remind you that your participation matters in the show. If you've enjoyed today's episode and want to stay updated on the latest in Municipal Affairs, please hit the subscribe button and like it so that way you can share it with your friends. Your support keeps us going and it's the best way to ensure that you never miss an episode. But your support also doesn't stop there. We also want to hear from you. If you have got a municipal story from your community, if you have seen something remarkable in the municipal world, or if you have been part of a project that is making a difference in your community, we want to hear from you. Your stories are the heartbeat of this show, and they inspire us all. So thank you for joining us today. And remember, in the world of municipal affairs, Every story counts. Tune in, like, subscribe, and share your news with us. Together, we can make differences in Canada's municipalities. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking. 